Thanks a lot um, for that great introduction, and, and Ken, Cindy, everyone else uh, with TED that's organized this. It's an amazing event, um, and I'm deeply flattered to be a part of it. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about the Luxury of the North project. Um, for me today, I think it's sort of more relevant and more important to talk sort of about the research and the ideas that have informed uh, the projects that I've been doing. I think there's some really important things going on in the world. Um, and I'm, I'm dealing with sort of an idea, it's called creative economic emergence, um, and it's, there's a deep relationship with creativity, economics, and the state of sustainability. So that's what we'll talk about today. So let's start with a question, so some quick feedback from you guys. So who do you think has the fastest growing creative economy in the world today? Who do you guys think? Sweden, India? China. China. Pretty close. Really interesting, supported by the UN, uh, by the Creative Economy uh, report that was done in 2008. So how do you guys think that they've been doing this? People? Well, it's interesting because um, the UNCTAD has said that China's become the world's top exporter of creative goods thanks to a policy that's encouraged uh, the you know, proliferation and the creation of creative goods. I don't have a laser point to here, but there's some really interesting statistics. If you look at the worldwide um, growth in creative goods, it's at 47% top right corner there. If you look at China, they're over 100% over the, that five-year period, and it's been growing since 2005. Uh, if you look at developing economies, 52%. Economies in transition, 116%. So there's something really exciting going on internationally. Unfortunately, a little bit outside of Canada, that's at 9%. So there's something going on here that I think that we have to start to look at. So what is, what's the market share roughly that you know, China's dealing with? So exports went from 18.4 billion in 96 to 61.3 billion in 2005. So if you include Greater Shanghai and 2000, or Greater uh, uh, Hong Kong, it's actually gone past 30% of world exports. The thing is, a lot of people might say, well, okay, this is a manufacturing statistic, Tim. It, you know, they're the manufacturer of what we create. Well, I mean, in part true, but the Chinese government, right up to the highest levels of, of government, to the president, has shifted from made in China to a created in China approach. And if, if you look at some statistics from the UN from 2000 to 2005, and again, it's been increasing, world trade of creative exports has gone up 8.7% per year. And you absolutely know that China's dealing with this. And they've been, you know, it's been sort of a blank slate so far for them. So they're really committed to competing in the, in the economy. So why is China doing this? Well, first of all, they recognize that creativity is a key resource in the knowledge economy. They understand that creativity leads to innovation and technological change. They embrace the concept that creativity leads to competitive advantages on a local and national level. It's generating a lot of money and market share for them. The other thing that they're doing is they're being really aggressive about headhunting, you know, some of the greatest creative minds from around the world. A friend of mine and colleague, uh, Lorraine Justice, she was the head of Georgia Tech Design School, a very famous, well-respected woman uh, in design education around the world. She was headhunted to the Hong Kong Polytechnico. And the reason I bring up her name, something amazing happened at a conference a couple years ago. She gave a keynote and she said, I'm incredibly excited and I'm incredibly scared. I'm incredibly excited because of what I see in our classes that students are creating. I'm incredibly excited because the amount of funding that I'm getting. I'm writing million dollar grants instead of thousand dollar grants. I'm incredibly scared for the West, she said. And this has really, really stuck with me. So there's something that is happening internationally and something that we have to consider. So this sort of background has you know, sort of led me to think more deeply over the last five years about ideas of creative economic emergence. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the relationship of this idea, this theory, creative economic emergence, uh, with China, and a little bit of background as to how I believe that design and the creative industries are forcing the emergence of a new competitive global economy that a lot of the speakers this afternoon are gonna be dealing with. So 
some background as to how I got to this idea of creative economic emergence. I started a project, um, I guess about a, five years ago now, in 2005. Um, it was supported by SHRC, which is the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council of Canada, a granting agency. The project was called Objective Regeneration. So, I mean, the output was kind of neat and novel. We were dealing with morphing materials, um, polymers and, and metals, where we could sort of rematerialize, regenerate the, an object. So we could heat up, for example, a polymer, and it would go flat. We could heat it up, remold it. We could heat it up, it would go flat. So we could do about 12 generations of a new object over and over. But really, that was sort of the result of really deeply questioning when the life of a material is over. Is the life of a material over when we actually no longer need the product? Does it have to be ground up and then shipped somewhere else and injection molded into something else? When is the life of an artifact over? Is it when it no longer functions, or is it when it's no longer desirable to us? So we started to look at you know, concepts of sustainable object desire and trying to deal with this. And so we got to a point of being able to, well, you know, what if we rematerialize something and created sustainable object desire and lengthened you know, what an artifact is, like how you define what an artifact is or how it could change. So with this, I, I started to look into epistemology and ideas of information flows, ideas of knowledge and how knowledge is shaped and why do we buy something? You know, who, who sort of encouraged us to buy that product? Where was our knowledge about that was a desirable product? So the ideas of epistemology, epistemology is a branch of philosophy and I'm certainly not an expert in it, but really it studies the foundations of knowledge and it looks at you know, basically questioning the distinction between true or adequate knowledge and false or inadequate knowledge about, well, why are we doing things? And I think that this is actually, though it's philosophy, I think it's really relevant for educators, for business people, for policymakers, for uh, government officials, because it gets into issues of scientific methodology. How are we doing something? How can we do something that's more competitive, better, smarter than the previous generation of something we did? So from here, I started looking a lot at, at information gaps between consumers and companies and how information forms knowledge and desirability and consumer values. So I started writing about something called the corporate consumer information communication gap. So it's really wordy. But basically just the idea was sort of looking at, at this concept of what is sustainability? Why is there so much waste in the world? So sort of on the far right side, we started to look at concepts of flows of information that, you know, if you, if you go back, say, even 100 years ago, the flows of information in, in communities were, was really current, accurate, and accessible. We live very locally, so what the knowledge base that we, you know, sort of formulated, the information that we got, it was very local. So we knew on a social, environmental, and economic level what was going on. Where today, I mean, we look around us, everything that's supporting this conference, the clothes we wear, what do we know about it? So what's happened over time is there's been a massive information gap between the corporate community who's designing, informing things, and yes, the creative community, and consumers. So we you know, started to recognize that this is really a bit of an issue, and it starts to deeply change what kinds of social cohesion are formed. Where is it formed from? Where is the origin of the social cohesion? Is it influenced a lot or a little bit by the corporation? by different sort of agendas that people have. So it sort of brought me and, and us to realizations that those that influence societal habits could be called social shapers. So nothing new to social scientists. And that altering and controlling information flows shapes knowledge. And that when you control and influence and shape knowledge, it alters motivational patterns. I am motivated to do something. And that altering motivational patterns, or actually what I'm gonna do, it forces forms of social cohesion. So relevant to this community and to all of you people here is how can we form new forms of social cohesion through creative outputs? I think is a really important thing as we go forward in the creative economy. So with this, the concept that, well, we, I've got to form new forms of social cohesion. I'm presenting it, and that sounds kind of simple, but clearly it's not. So I started to look into issues of complexity, and the word chaos started coming up a lot, you know, chaos in the global system and the environment and how many people are involved. So I actually then, and sort of recently over the last couple of years, started to look into complexity theory. And an interesting thing in complexity theory I found 
was that when chaos occurs within linear systems, so let's say a linear system is kind of the economics of what's been going on for a long time, it's been somewhat linear, that emergence of new adaptive behaviors occurs and new forms of order take place over time. So the important thing about chaos theory and chaos theorists is that this is completely consistent in you know, natural and human systems. So if we start to look at what's going on in the environment, you know, sort of us hitting the wall environmentally, if we th think of what's going on you know, with the global financial crisis, we start to go, wow, I mean, there's an opportunity for emergence. And there's other things that are sort of spurring this on as well. So the question then is, is this a problem or opportunity? And you know, clearly I think it's an opportunity. So this sort of has led me into this thesis of creative economic emergence. You know, that, and again, given the scope and scale of the global financial and environmental crises that are ongoing, and the growing economic power of the creative communities I'll get to in a second, statistically, I believe that new adaptive behaviors are currently occurring, and it isn't just modifications of previous behavior, I think is the important thing to understand. I think that we're so deep in this bubbling pot that we can't see past the rim that something really new is going on on a global level. And I'll just touch on some of the things briefly here. So this is why I believe that creative economic emergence is occurring, that the creative communities are forcing the emergence of new economic systems. Oop, I'm gonna go back here. Um, this from L Richard Florida, a lot of us have heard about him, read about him. I think it's one of the better graphs that sort of show what's been happening on a demographic and a social level. If we sort of look here on, on the left side, you know, in the early 1900s, you know, at the working class, the agricultural class as a percentage of the population compared to the creative communities, and look at today, you know, we start to see that the working class and agricultural class went from 74% roughly to 28%, so a threefold change. The opposite service and creative classes went from 30% to roughly 86%. So we've seen a threefold, a complete flop in social structures in who's earning what, et cetera. So the question then, I believe, is that have we seen that same kind of fundamental change in how we deal with the environment, with society, um, and with economics? Have we seen massive, massive changes? We've seen changes, but I believe that the, they've been linear changes. So I think that this is where the ideas of emergence come in. You know, we're seeing really powerful people in the creative communities, you know, demographically and from an income level, starting to deeply influence what's going on. And I'm really excited to hear some of the leaders in these areas talk this afternoon. So again, the thesis, creative economic emergence, is that given the scope and scale of the global financial and environmental crises, the growing economic power and influence of the creative communities that I just showed you, uh, that new adaptive behaviors are occurring right now, it's the creative communities, I believe, that are altering motivational patterns, actions, and future economies. And I believe this is the state of environmental sustainability in the future. So certainly these things have been going on, but what are some other emergent forces that are spurring this on? So I think that we're seeing short-term uh, or, or shortage in the things that we use and the things that we make stuff with. So oil productivity, you know, you're drilling a well, what's the productivity? Same thing with oil or with gas wells, what's the productivity? Steep declines in that is what we're seeing. We're seeing shortages in short-term volatility, long-term price increases in the things that we depend on. Sort of the sister to this is demand for energy. So we're seeing massive increases in demand for energy, you know, sharp drops in productivity. We're seeing permanent changes in the global economic demand curve. So sort of pulling a page from Chris Anderson's book, The Long Tail, and this is something that economic historians look at, have, have known about for a long time, The Long Tail, is that in the past, everybody wanted to compete in the steep head, the volumetric section in the red section over there. That's where profit was. That's Britney Spears, people like that. But this, act, this demand curve has changed, and a lot of people don't get that. I'm sure a lot of you do, being in the creative communities. But the volume is, you know, it's starting to happen in the long tail. So that's forcing new forms of social cohesion. And we really have to be aware of that, I believe. So we're, we're seeing a global economy that is encountering emergence because of, I believe, a deeply inefficient production consumption system that's reached production technology distribution and human productivity ceilings. And that's not to be mixed up with the, the kinds of innovations that we're going to hear this afternoon. 
in, in technologies, in thinking. It's, what this refers to is just using sort of technology as we know it, offshoring to China and trying to you know, generate efficiencies that way. We've hit so many ceilings in that area that we need new forms of innovation and that's what we're starting to see. Fifth, a global economy and environment that has lost economic and environmental productivity in just a ton of areas that I don't have time to get into here. You know, from food productivity, you know, at an agricultural level, well, why aren't we, you know, decreasing the prices of food, for example, when we're actually starting to see real sh sharp increases in it? You know, massive waste on our part, but also offshore generated on our behalf at a manufacturing level. So, I think that what we need to do as a creative community, as policymakers, government officials, businesses, is we have to foster key moments, strategic moments of emergence to occur. I think what we want to do is create the kind of flow that we want. And what I mean by flow is it's sort of analogous to you know, things that complexity theorists talk about. If we imagine we've got this beautiful smooth tube and water's running down and it's a, it's a stream. We've got a linear system, is what chaos theorists talk about. If we start to throw a lot of different rocks into there, we get nonlinear systems, we get chaos. And I think that that's really true if we think about what globalism has been, is that there's so many different inputs from so many different motivational points that we've had a completely chaotic system. But I think that we're hitting moments of emergence where new adaptive behaviors are occurring, where we can actually consciously control what is being put in and to look at these opportunities. So that's sort of the whole idea here, and, and fundamentally not to think in isolation of ourselves, socially, environmentally, politically even. I think that we have to benefit from the fact that 60 to 80 percent of the environmental impact from products are determined at the design stage. A really deeply important statistic. Third, third, third. We must compete within the creative economy because quite, quite fundamentally, as I think a lot of us know, this culture and community are now the dominant social shaper of cultural habits, purchasing patterns, and consumer values. Fourth, that I don't think artifacts can any longer be relegated to being passive participants in our aesthetic landscape. I think that we're starting to realize that they have to become motivational points for establishing new behaviors, norms, and for transforming economies. And as a source of change, I've got a quote here from, from Drucker, who's probably the most well-known author uh, on the knowledge economy. He basically writes about saying the best basic economic resource of the future, the means of production is no longer capital, nor natural resource, nor labor. It is, has been, and will be knowledge. The only thing that I could humbly add to what he writes about is that how are we forming knowledge by who? And I argue really strongly sometimes through research and evidence, that it's got to be the cre creative communities and we've got to sort of as, as a broad unit understand and I think you know, each other and that's what Ted is trying to do with us here. So I'm going to end on this really quickly. I just want to give a great big thanks to the people involved in the Luxury North project. Um, people like Rennie Ramakers of Droch Design out of Amsterdam, uh, Cynthia Hathaway who's a, a Canadian now living in Amsterdam for the last decade, Winnie Moss, uh, Ed van Hunt um, from Eternally Yours, Oli Bauman, the director of the Netherlands Institute of Architecture. So, I mean, working with these people for me is, is profoundly flattering. I, I can't believe I have an opportunity to do this. Um, and I think one thing that Droog has, has done, and Droog, if you don't know them, they're a, a famous, famous, famous furniture design company that has influenced the state of furniture contemporary design on an international level. And they're really sticking, sticking their neck out now. Uh, Rennie Ramakers has seen that the state of design globally needs fundamental changes. And their goal as, as a company now is to help redefine the next generation of global design through exposing urgencies related to socioeconomic and environmental sustainability. And that's why about a dozen of us are going up north to Pond Inlet in the top of the Baffin Islands. And we're going to hang out and just see what can be done from a northern perspective with luxury products, with sustainability, and the state of design for the future. That's it. Thanks a lot and enjoy TED. Yeah.